love the Thunderbirds, actually. Tell us about your early memories of Thunderbirds. Well, like a lot of kids, um, my first experience with Thunderbirds growing up in the late 70s, early 80s was actually through their dad, you know. My, my dad had these wonderful Thunderbirds annuals that I used to study and read. And, um, and then, of course, uh, around that time as well, they were starting to air, or re-air, I should say, a lot of the original series and a lot of the Jerry Anderson stuff on, um, I think it was like Friday afternoon, maybe 4pm, somewhere around then. Um, and it was just wonderful, so inspirational at an early age. I mean, the great thing about the original series is that you can tell that things are handcrafted. You can tell that, you know, you can see the paintwork on the vehicles. You can see that the, the water is miniature water. So, you know, for a young kid, that's really inspiring, and it made me want to make models of my own. And, um, you know, I didn't have much money, so, you know, I just basically get old Wheatbix packets and, and, you know, build models of Thunderbird 4 and Thunderbird 2. and. Um, and see if I could emulate what I saw on the screen. So, yeah. <laughs> so this is something that's kind of in your blood. It's not just a project you've come to in later life. It's got a bit of a special oh, attachment for you. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, I, and I really hope that we're able to, um, through the use of miniatures and our techniques that we're using, they're pretty much the same techniques as we use in the original show. And I really hope we can inspire that new generation to be able to do that as well, go out and um, make things and build things, find things around the home. Yeah. When you say that new generation, for anyone who's going, who are the Thunderbirds, what do you say to that question? <laughs> well, um, I mean, basically, the, the way I'd sort of pitch Thunderbirds is, it's kind of like if you could imagine Iron Man 20 years from now, and he's got five kids, you know, and, 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 and what would they do, and, you know, because, I mean, essentially, Jeff Tracy is, is very, very similar to, like, a Tony Stark kind of character, you know, he's had this wonderful career as, a, um, as an engineer, a pretty, um, quite, quite a, a terrible um, disaster happened to them um, early on in the kids' childhood, which inspired Jeff to to do something about it and create a civilian rescue organisation that uh, that will, you know, help people in need. And, and he's recruited his own boys to do it. You know, it's uh, it's, it's it's pretty pretty dramatic when you think about it in those terms. It's <laughs> an enduring thing, isn't it? It's not just one that doesn't really die, does it? Well, I think so. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, for our series, the uh, the technology is updated and, and a lot of things. But I think the, the that base core DNA of a of a family going out to sacrifice their own lives uh, to, to save you know the regular members of the public. That's exactly as it was. And I think um, and the, the jeopardy there is can be really intense sometimes. I mean, um, it's not like they're going out you know, with, with someone who they're in a team with or, or a work colleague, this is actually family. You know, you might have a, a moment where one of the boys is actually acknowledging that his brother's going to die in this mission, you know, um, and, but, it's, but he knows it's the right thing to do because, the, you know, there's lives on the line. So, yeah. So a good message. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, selfless heroism. They've never been out for the glory either. It's, it's, it is very, very selfless. And at the end of the day, they'll go home and, um, you know, maybe they'll see... The, the rescue that they, they just completed on the news, but you know, the, whoever they are, it's still a little bit of a mystery. They're not there at a, um, you know, seeking the glory or hanging around for a, you know, a photo opportunity or anything. It's it's all just their job is to rescue people, and then they just want to get out of there and you know live their lives. You know. So in this concept, what did you set out to achieve in creating the series? I mean, this is a cult series <laughs> from 50 years ago, isn't it? So what did you want to achieve? Well, um, I mean, it's just a, just a, sort of like a bringing, bringing those values of selfless heroism back onto the screen. I, I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of sort of superheroes, you know, out these days. A lot of a lot of uh, very larger than life characters, and and what's great about Thunderbirds is they're just regular people. I mean, they they do have additional resources, obviously, because their dad's a billionaire. But, I mean, they're real people and the problems they encounter are real problems and they don't have any magic button that solves the problems. They're not out there with a, a special superpower that allows them to rescue. They're, and In the episodes, we see them encountering problems. Their A plan always fails. They have to come up with something on the spot. That usually encounters some kind of difficulty. And then they finally, through problem solving together, working together, I mean, it's... it's uh, I, I think it's just you know, it's about regular people so um, helping regular people. So. Were there particular challenges to make this story that's quite or the series that's quite old now, I suppose, appeal to a modern audience? Well, that's the thing. I mean, um, I realise there's going to be a few fans out there that'll be um, 
you know, questioning why we've changed things. But basically, the reason we've made the changes um, is because the world has changed. You know, I mean, we're 50 years on, and um, one example is. Uh, you know, Thunderbird 5 and Thunderbird 3 back in the, you know, the middle of the space race, it was just exciting that there was characters in space at all. You know, it was pretty, pretty amazing that there was a vehicle that could travel into space. But now, you know, we can imagine any number of disaster scenarios that would involve, you know, the International Space Station coming down or, or some kind of asteroid about to hit the Earth. And so we've really thought about those rescue scenarios um, long and hard and, and, and sort of thought about a process of how a modern organisation like International Rescue would operate in the world today. And from there, from those discussions and those, um, and, and those uh, sort of thinking things through logically, that's where the changes have come from. So any changes to the vehicles have usually stemmed from the need for additional pieces of equipment on the vehicles, which would for, you know, allow them to complete better rescues. Okay. Some of the um, nuts and bolts, how many people have you got working on it since it's a co-production with Weta and Well, RTD I mean, uh, and it's huge, isn't it? yeah, it is. I mean, I'd probably estimate around 300 people. I mean, and it's, it's very far-reaching. It's not just New Zealand and England. It's New Zealand. There's a writing team in LA. There are animators in Taipei. There is a 60-piece orchestra in Prague. <laughs> um, because one thing um, people may not know is that all of our um, episodes are scored. Um, with with Ben and Nick Foster, who did uh, Doctor Who and Torchwood, and and they went they went to Prague, and they and some of that footage is just mind blowing. Here's on the back of your neck, stand up, you know. So yeah, very very large crew, um, very very dedicated, and and just a sheer passion for on uh, uh, over, across everybody for the original series. Yeah. Well, okay. Um, can we ask costs? I don't know. Being the director, they don't sort of share that information with me. I'll, I'll get. Yeah, it's kind of nice not to know. Yeah. <laughs> Secretly. Yes. <laughs> don't really want to know that. Yeah. So it's having its debut in London this Saturday. Uh, right? Actually, just it? just this about five or six hours ago, I believe. Oh, yeah, really? They did so, a, a, a huge screening at the BFI in London. Um, about 500 people there. Some of the biggest fans of Thunderbirds were invited. Um, cast and crew, all of that kind of stuff. Okay. So, yeah, and tonight we get that opportunity here in Wellington. I saw the woman who was um, Lady Penelope in the ITV story this morning. Oh, Sylvia Anderson? Yes. Yeah, yeah she was um, fabulous. And, and quite yes, 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 yes. And still very passionate about the time of it. Very passionate, very, um, very quick-witted and had a, a great deal of insight um, to, to offer as well. I mean, um, you know, we've really tried to keep that original core DNA. We haven't sort of paid... Um, paid a surface sort of level tribute to the original show, we've really tried to keep to the original core values. So even though some of the technologies change and things, um, I, th I think hopefully she'll be very proud of what we've done. <laughs> strings. No strings. <laughs> on puppets. Yeah, no strings. I mean, that's one of the big changes of this series, of course, is uh, that we, uh, we don't have marionettes anymore. And I guess the, probably the biggest driving reason behind that um, was so that we could get the boys more involved in the actual rescues. Um, you know, in, in this series, rather than Scott purely just driving Thunderbird 1, you'll actually see him you know, get out of the cockpit, abseil down, personally help somebody. You might see him running across a cliff edge and then base jumping down. You'll see him on top of a train. You know? So in that sense, we really wanted to make them feel like five minutes of James Bonds. You know? So um, that was pretty much the driving reason. I mean, there's, there's little things like, you know, maybe expressions can be better, but I mean, um, you know, just thinking about James Bond, how many different facial expressions can you remember from Daniel Craig? Probably not many. He's just got the, the one quite stoic look. <laughs> the one look. Daniel Craig look. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was, it was mainly driven by, um, by a, really a, a feeling was that we wanted to get a lot more action and actually have the boys very personally involved in each rescue scenario. Despite enormous quantum leaps in animation since the technology that was used in the 60s, you're still using a lot of little models, aren't you? Well, yeah. I mean, it's. Uh, I mean, firstly, the original. I mean, for me, seeing it as a as a kid, like the fact that uh, you could tell things were handmade. I mean, that was that was a big part of the show for a lot of people, as well as just the great stories and um, you know, the com compelling um, vehicles and things. The, the DNA is sort of wrapped up in, in the, the, the approach to building the models and all that kind of stuff as well. So yes, we felt like it was very, very important to, to preserve that. And even, uh, even with the backgrounds, we've made them miniature, but even with the CG vehicles, we've also incorporated miniature elements into those vehicles as well. And what I mean by that is 
We've tried very hard to make our CG vehicles look like they could have been made in miniature and animate them in a way that looks like they could have possibly been you know, a more sophisticated version of trains, you know, driving it. And we've also had the Weta Workshop team, the same team that's actually built these models, have actually hand-painted all the textures for the CG vehicles as well. So I think there's a very, very tight integration that uh, you probably wouldn't normally see. It's a, it's a, it's a really unique look as well. Fantastic. Well, congratulations. Thanks.